At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. Uh, so today we're going to be uh, shifting gears a little bit. You guys have been learning a lot of cool stuff this morning uh, about STEM-related fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, and so we're going to talk about a field that sort of merges all this together very seamlessly. It's called neuroscience. Uh, and so the neuroscience is the study of the brain. And typically to study neuroscience, uh, you have to go to school for a long time. Uh, I went to school for 23 years. I'm embarrassed. My parents keep asking, like, how, how are you going to graduate? You know. So uh, by the time you get to reach around to grade 18, you actually start to be able to do neuroscience. You have to start to learn the tools and techniques to be able to understand the brain. And it seems a bit of a shame because you know, 20% of the entire world, that's, that's one out of five people have a neurological disorder. So shouldn't we be teaching neuroscience a little bit earlier in the careers so that people can start thinking about, maybe I want to become a neuroscientist, you know, because we don't actually do that technique right now because it costs forty to $50,000 to run a lab and be able to record from the brain. So we've kind of come up with a way to sort of change that. And so you guys are going to be all today are going to be neuroscientists. You're going to learn about electrophysiology, all these other words. Uh, and it's, we're going to go through and I'm going to point out all the areas of STEM throughout it so you guys can understand this is a real good area for science to, to learn all of these techniques. Uh, and so one of the things I'd like to point to is that you don't have to become an astrophysics uh, PhD to be able to look at the heavens, right? You can just go and buy a cheap telescope at Walmart. You can set up in your backyard, and you're already starting to begin to understand a little bit how the heavens work. And maybe you're interested in becoming an astronomer. Uh, but there's nothing like that in biological sciences until today. And so what we've introduced is this guy right here. And this is a, it's sort of the telescope for the brain. It allows you to peer in and see really, really, really small things. Uh, electricity, we're going to amplify it. We're going to be able to see exactly how the brain works. Uh, and so we're going to be able to uh, use just your devices, like your, your cell phones or your iPads, to be able to actually uh, see inside the brain so you can actually understand and measure the signals. So you get a really good understanding of how the brain works. You guys with me so far? Yeah. All right. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the brain. This is the science part of uh, STEM. Uh, so the brain is made up of 100 billion cells. It's a lot of cells. Uh, these cells are called neurons, and they have a very special shape. They have a cell body with a nucleus, like you guys are familiar with most cells. But they have a really long arm, and that arm is called an axon. And that axon reaches out, and it touches other neurons. And so it's, it's down this axon that the information of everything that we know in the world, everything that we love, is passed in the form of electricity, and electricity is called a spike. And so the spike has a very unique wave shape. It's a very small amount of current, a lot of little teeny amount of electricity. And what we're going to do is we're going to amplify it, and we're going to actually see inside the brain for the very first time for most of us here, OK? All right, so we're not going to use my brain, if I have Cam come up. Uh, we're going to use the brain of la cucarachas. These are uh, South American cockroaches. Uh, so these guys normally live in the barks of trees, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to peer into his brain and understand a little bit about how the action potentials, or spikes, sort of uh, work. And so first thing we're going to do is we're going to anesthetize this guy, because every time you get a surgery, you don't want to be awake for it. So the same thing goes for these cockroaches. Whoops. Uh-oh. <laughs> Disaster. Okay. So what we have here is I've got a, uh, a bowl of ice water. I couldn't find a cup, so I just cut a... Uh, uh, water bottle in half. All right, so inside there, you're gonna, I'm gonna put, I put the cockroach in ice water right now. And so you're going to see a behavioral change in just a moment. It only takes a few seconds. So what's going to happen is that as uh, insects are cold-blooded, and unlike us, if I put you in, in cold water for a couple minutes, you'd be like, hey, can I get out now? But these cockroaches, they, they're going to completely change. Now it's only been a few seconds. I take them out. And now this cockroach that was moving is now completely still. And so why is that? I'm going to put them back in the water. Because these, these action potentials, or spikes, that are being passed around allow our brain to sort of bring in information from the outside world, but they also control our muscles. We also send information out to the muscles. And so as things get colder, they slow down. The ion channels can't open and close. When the ion channels can't open, they can't send spikes. If they can't send spikes, they can't move, and they can't feel pain. So that's perfect, because we want them not to feel pain, because we're about to do uh, neurosurgery on them. All right, are you guys with me so far? 
All right, so the cockroaches cannot feel pain right now. So what we can do is we are going to remove one of his legs and we're gonna record from the neurons inside those legs, all right? So if you watch me, I'm gonna take one of his legs and use a pair of uh, very expensive surgical equipment. Now, these are just nail clippers. And we're gonna take and cut off that leg right there. And so before you get too scared or too, uh, whoops, okay. Before you start feeling too bad for the cockroaches, they're a little bit different than us. They're way ahead of us in, uh, in evolution and they're gonna be able to regrow these legs, which is kind of a neat thing about insects is that they can regrow their, uh, their antennas and their legs. So the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna take this leg and I'm gonna stick uh, a pin inside the cockroach. Can you guys all see this? All right. I'm gonna put another pin inside here. And so what are pins made out of? Metal. Does metal conduct electricity? Yeah. All right. So if we had a little bit of electricity inside this leg, what we should be able to do is allow it to flow into our invention and then be able to sort of look at that electricity. And the first thing I wanna do is I wanna to listen to the electricity. And I'm gonna turn on the speaker here. I want you guys all to listen, all right? You guys all hear that? So I hear people say it sounds like rain, sounds like popcorn, that's a good one, or sizzling bacon. But actually, this is what your brain sounds like. If we were to open up your brain and put a little wire in there and put a speaker on it, this is what it would sound like. And this is how information gets passed around. So if we look inside of his leg, he's got all these beautiful hairs that are running down there, and each hair has a neuron inside of it. And that neuron is sending information back to the brain about you know, touching or vibrations, which is why it's really hard to catch a cockroach, because they, they have these sensors, and they can tell that you're coming just from the vibrations. And so what we're listening to are the, is that neuron inside the hair sending information back to the body. Even though the leg's been cut off, that neuron doesn't know that. It's going to keep sending information, right? So what we can do is do an experiment now. So let me cut back to the camera. And so we already said that this, this spike is going to send, or this, these neurons are sending information about touch. So what would happen if I were to touch the, uh, the cockroach leg? We can see if we hear a change. You guys ready? You guys, see, you guys hear that? All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on this iPad here. And then Cam, if you can take a look at this over here. Let's see if I can hold it towards you. And so I'm going to do it again. And so what you're looking at, those little uh, lines that you're seeing coming across are the actual neurons sending impulses of electricity from one neuron to the other. We stuck a pin in the middle of the axon, and we're now recording that electricity as it passes by. So I'm going to touch it again. You're going to see an increase in the amount of spikes. So you guys see that. So let's take a look at what one spike looks like. I'm going to put it on a threshold mode. I'm going to bring the threshold down. And so now we're going to zoom in on this guy. And so that is the actual thing about how the brain works. Have you ever seen the movie The Matrix and you're like, oh my God, that's how the, that's how the reality is because that's a code of how the, the universe is. This is the real code about how the universe works for you. This is what's happening into your brain right now, right now, when you hear me, when you see me. Everything that you know, everything you've loved, your favorite you know, Nationals baseball player, all these are encoded by these spikes right here inside your brain. And so that's how everything that we do actually functions is through this guy right here called the action potential, or spike. So uh, as you can see uh, on, the, on, the, on the bottom left, is like when I touch the leg with, a, with the barb, that's what you're seeing there, you see an increase in the number of action potentials, and that's how, in, that's how information is encoded in the brain. It's called rate code. It took a long time for a neuroscientist to do, but now we can do that pretty quickly. In the, uh, in the classroom. You can bring it around anywhere. You know, you can bring it on an uh, airplane. We brought it up there. We tell people, hey, stop by our seats. And you can see actually how the brain works. On a three-hour flight, people would stop by and they'd check it out. You know, we keep track of how many people have seen spikes for the first time. Because if you ask any electrophysiologist or neuroscientist why they started studying the brain, they always say the same thing. When I first heard the neurons for the first time, I be instantly became hooked. And so we keep track of how many students have seen it. 33,000 people have seen it in the last few years, which is kind of cool. So we're, we're starting to get the, the numbers up. Uh, now we're gonna go into the, the mathematics a little bit of STEM. Uh, we're, here's an earthworm, and what you can do is, uh, we're looking at the neurons passing by, but we actually don't know how fast they are. They could be extremely fast or extremely slow. So what we can do is we can uh, put two pins in, a, in, a, uh, in an earthworm, 
and plus one reference pin, and you can watch as an, as an action pencil passes by both pins. And so as you see, there's a distance in, in the measurement of the two electrodes that you can measure, so that's your distance. And then your, you can also measure the distance in time, if you're recording at the same time, of how long the spike takes to pass by each one. And so if you take distance and divide it by time, what do you get? Does anyone know what that is? In, in, it's speed, so your cars are miles per hour, for example. So now you take the distance, you divide it by the time, and you can, turns out you can calculate how fast it is. And so an action potential travels about 18 miles per hour from your head down to your legs, for example. Uh, and it doesn't seem very fast to you, but actually it's pretty fast to have these little mechanical things inside your bile, these wet wires sort of passing information around. Now to the engineering. Uh, so we also release these kits uh, in a form so that you yourself will be able to build them. And so we have uh, bags of parts that we send now. We, we, we give your teachers the, uh, the background and how to solder them to self. And uh, we can run workshops where you guys will actually do that. We're going to be doing some of that today. Uh, we also give you the schematics to so actually to learn to be an electrical engineer yourself because you're going to be building these tools which you're going to use to use science. All right, and so I want to talk, I want to show you one quick video of, of some of the more advanced stuff we're doing so we can even peer into how the brain sees things, okay? We're going to show you a grasshopper now. Now, the grasshopper does something that's pretty amazing. It only has an eye on either side of the body, but it can still detect when something's coming at it. And so how does it do that? Uh, we actually can do an experiment. And so here's a, a, a grasshopper we're putting on ice, and similar we did with the cockroach. But now we're using our, our 3D printed microscope uh, which typically costs like $15,000. And so now we've put a wire inside the, the cockroach, or excuse me, the grasshopper. And as you can see, as I move my uh, little stylus back and forth, those beautiful neurons that you remember seeing when we just saw it just now are now responding to, not to touch, but to the visual cues of this guy moving back and forth. And so the next thing we can do is ask the question, the scientific question, is getting back to the science part, is how, do the cock, or how does the grasshopper escape? And so what we can do is we can pretend to throw things at the grasshopper. And so we put a screen there, and we're having something kind of being thrown at it. And we change the speed. We can do all these different scientific measurements. And we can see exactly what those neurons are responding to. And right before he gets hit, you see those neurons fire. The neuron inside the brain is sending it back to his jump muscles so he can jump and escape. And that's how, that's how grasshoppers can do it. The brain does pretty amazing things. All right. So let's do one more experiment here. So let's do a, uh, something that Galvani did over 200 years ago. And this was uh, the, uh, the inspiration for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. That was the idea that you could take the, the nerves of a, of a frog leg and sort of uh, hook it up to some wires. And he hooked it up to a, a lightning bolt uh, uh, rod. And then when lightning would hit it, he would capture the lightning, but also he would put it inside the, the frog legs. And he saw for the very first time that the, the electricity that was out there in the world is the same that's inside of our own bodies. You know, it's kind of a neat discovery. But we can do the same thing. We're not going to use lightning rods. What we're going to use is a cell phone. Uh, and so you may not know this, but inside everybody's cell phone, you have a signal generator. Uh, so if you plug in your, your earbuds ever and you put them in your ears, what's happening when you hit play is that when the music is sending electrical current around a magnet. The magnet moves back and forth. That, that uh, magnet produces sound uh, against a cone, and then you hear that, and then that's how music is played. But that current that makes that magnet move is the same current that's in our brain. So what we should be able to do is I should be able to plug this in. Uh, so we get to the live camera again, Paul. I'm going to hook up my little jumper cables here. And I'm going to place it onto the cockroach leg, like so, and like so. So now the electrical current is flowing outside of my phone and into the, let me turn this off for a second, and into the cockroach leg. I'm going to hit play here. We'll see if it works. All right, so what do you guys see? Do you guys notice anything changing with the cockroach leg? Yeah, so what, what's happening is that when the electrical current comes by from those base frequencies, those really, really low frequencies, it allows that current to actually cause those neurons to fire, which causes the muscles to twitch, and then we'll be able to actually see that in the cockroach leg. So if, if we had a little bit more time, we can go through and sort of map it out and see if we put opera on, if you're a culture vulture, you'll see that, uh, that opera music doesn't work. And so you can ask the question, why doesn't opera music work? And so it turns out it has to do with the frequency. It has to do with timing. 
Uh, I want to show you one more video. So this is the mapping of it. So you can see that at lower frequencies is where we see the cockroach leg moving. Uh, at higher frequencies, it goes away. So lower frequencies came with the, mm, mm, the, the hip hop bass music, right? So if you go to more like older music, like you know, Baroque opera, you're not going to you're not going to see that. You can you can have it as loud as you want. You'll never see that cockroach leg move, which is kind of weird. I want to show you one more experiment we did with squid. We've hooked up the, uh, the same thing here, an iPhone now to a patch of squid. And so now we're going to be looking inside a, a piece of squid skin. And so we played the music uh, from my iPod into a microscope that's connected to the squid. And what you're seeing are actual muscles inside the squid. So squid are uh, one, of, one of maybe a handful of creatures that can control the color of their skin through electrical impulses in their brain. That's why they can do it really, really quickly. And so by putting hip hop music into there, what you're seeing is that the electrical currents are causing those neurons to fire, which cause things called chromatophores, which have color in it, to turn on, and you're able to see exactly how the brain can control the color of the skin. All right, so there we go. So I'm gonna hook up myself just to show that that same stuff that we saw inside of the, uh, the cockroach is actually happening inside of us. So if I record from my arm, I can record the electrical activity from my brain down to my muscles, okay? And so I'm gonna hook up the, uh, the spiker box now to my arm. And we can see, so as I flex my muscles here, you're seeing that electrical activity. So this is, this is actually my brain communicating directly to my muscles in there. And so that you can actually do a lot of interesting experiments. For, there's a, before we could actually record from the brain, we could record things called reaction times. You can actually measure how long it takes your eye to respond to things. And with that, there's a rich history in the, in the neuroscience literature. Now we can do that in the classroom, which is kind of exciting. But let's bring out the most exciting thing yet. What is that? It's a cockroach wearing a backpack. But why is it wearing a backpack? This is the world's first commercially available cyborg in the history of all of mankind. And it came out of the United States. It's kind of cool, isn't it? All right, so we're going to talk about who we, we launched this as a, as a Kickstarter project. We asked the world, do you guys want to see a cyborg? And they kind of said, eh, kind of. You know, we barely raised our goal, but that's good. Uh, and so a cockroach, if you look at the behavior of the cockroach, uh, if he's walking down the, the hall and he feels some wind on the left-hand side, it's going to turn and walk to the right because it wants to avoid that, right? And so he's walking this way and he feels something on the right side, it's going to turn and walk to the left. And so what we can do is we know, because we can stick a wire inside that antenna and we can record the spikes and we know exactly why that thing is turning because there's neurons inside the antenna that tell the brain that there's something on the left and it turns and goes to the right. But what would happen if we stuck a tiny little wire inside that antenna and then put a little bit of current inside of there. And so instead of the neuron firing because of wind, it fires because we told it to, right? So maybe what could happen is that we get the cockroach to move the way we want. He may not be working. So that's all right. That's why we like live demos. So uh, if we can get him just to walk. Oh, there he goes. He is working. So when the light comes on, you notice that he's walking to the opposite side of which the, uh, the stimulation is occurring. And so what you've just witnessed it took a long time in science. It's actually, this was a, a DARPA project uh, that cost taxpayers millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but we, we now sell these kits for under $100. That's kind of neat. So like, this, is, this is the same electrical stimulation that's used in deep brain stimulation, for example, for treating Parkinson's disease or cochlear implants for treating deafness. Uh, and so what we can do is bring this into your classrooms and you can actually learn about the same parameter space that real scientists use in the world to actually cure these neurological diseases. Uh, we're growing. We're in 59 countries, in 59 countries within classrooms, in high schools, and grade schools in theirs. And what, and the, what I'm excited to announce today is that we're actually going to be going on the International Space Station soon. That muscle thing you were saw, we're going to actually look at what happens at muscles in, in low gravity, right, microgravity, and actually measure that over time and have students on Earth do the same experiments as students, the astronauts in space, and we're going to measure the results and see how they change across time, which is going to be kind of a neat thing. And so uh, one of the things I want to leave you with is that uh, we have dozens and dozens of experiments and each one is focused at some particular area of neuroscience. Uh, and one of the things I like to say, to, especially to a, a whole room full of students, is that this is this, these, a lot of these experiments came from ideas for you. So if you guys come up with ideas and you're out there, but you're wondering how the brain works, you know, you can stop by, you can send us an email, and, and we love turning your ideas into real neuroscience experiments. So thank you so much. Thank you.